Okay, well, I'll get... Uh, I'll Just get so you know, I want you to sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as long as you won't be uh, timing me as carefully as you do in the class. Um, so, uh, I'll get started. Um, my name is Theodore Caputi. I'm a student in the Master's of Public Health here. Um, and essentially, I was talking with uh, Professor Kabir a few months ago um, about some of the work that I've done um, outside of the class, some of the research work that I've done in public health, and he uh, asked me if I might be willing to share some of it. Um, so what I want to do, I realize that my the, the topic is is uh, behavioral epidemiology and surveillance for public health using traditional and novel data sources, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that. Hopefully, we'll learn something about it. But I want to start off by just saying a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Penn last year uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Economics, so I actually never taken a health course before. Um, and now I'm here courtesy of the Mitchell Scholarship, which has been uh, this great program that brings 12 um, students to Ireland to do a uh, master's degree for a year and really expanded my horizons uh, in terms of what I've been able to learn and learn so much about health. Um, but the big point is that you know, I just started doing this kind of research um, a few years ago, uh, two years ago, and so I'm still very much learning. And as opposed to trying to tell you that I'm the world's greatest expert in X, Y, or Z, which I am none of, uh, my idea is to just kind of walk you through some of the research projects that I've done and what I've learned along the way uh, and what I'm continuing to learn more about and how I've really enjoyed it. And um, you know, you, uh, I have my email address, I'll have it here and I'll have it at the end. Um, you know, I'm still learning, I'm really excited to meet people and to talk to people who are interested in the same kind of research or who can offer advice or uh, feedback on the kind of work that I'm doing because uh, just just getting started. So I realize that the first few slides will probably be uh, basic for a lot of people who are here who are from the School of Public Health. Um, the idea is, just in case there's somebody who's not, um, Epidemiology is what I think that outside of the School of Public Health, maybe a lot of people think of epidemiology as being tracking infectious diseases. You know, they think about epidemiologists tracking Zika or tracking Ebola, um, which are all very important things. Uh, it's kind of the prototypical example of um, epidemiology is uh, John Snow in, in England um, tracked down, uh, you know, that there was disease clusters around these wells found that maybe this disease is related to the water somehow, maybe we should try to get people a different water source. Uh, he didn't even know what was going on, he didn't know about germs, uh, but he said, this is, you know, something's going on here, we might want to change it, and that ended up saving lives. Um, so, in a lot of ways, uh, health has evolved uh, for the past hundred years, um, especially in developed countries, we're faced less and less with infectious diseases, although there's still a significant concern. Um, but behavioral health has been taken you know, a very big uh, step into the limelight over the past few years. People have realized that the decisions they make on a day-to-day -day basis have a real impact on their lifelong health. And the idea for behavioral epidemiology is to just kind of track, um, especially in terms of surveillance, is to track some of the behaviors that people um, choose to do or the decisions they choose to make, uh, what some of the risk factors are for some, you know, bad health outcomes, and, and um, figure out how we might be equipped to uh, change people's um, behaviors. Specifically for surveillance, this basically means answering the right questions at the right time. Uh, surveillance basically just means, you know, trying to figure out what the emerging trends are and uh, bringing them to the forefront of the discussion so that we can talk about what possible interventions might work, whether we should divert resources to something else, how we can fix things that way. Um, and that's where this starts. So I'll say that when I started off in public health, I started off in substance use disorders. And over the past year, especially with the masters, I've been um, broadening out and learning a lot about all these different kinds of behavioral health um, Topics and there's all sorts of very interesting things that affect people. And while they all have this kind of idea that people are making decisions that may or may, you know, um, making decisions might sound a little 
might not be the best wording because we have you know, environmental, societal, all sorts of other factors that are contributing to what those decisions are. But nonetheless, there are decisions that, have ha that are happening that affect people's health. And uh, things like depression, anxiety, HIV risk, substance use, nutrition, diet, and exercise, all very interesting topics. And about a year ago, I joined a research team that does a lot of the surveillance using, they use traditional, mostly novel data. Um, and what I was surprised to find is that they're really, they don't consider themselves to be topic man, topic man or experts in anything. They're more into the methodologies, figuring out cool ways to apply these new novel data sources to interesting topics that people might care about. And that's uh, what we'll get to later. But we'll start off with where I started. Uh, where I started was with traditional surveillance, which is basically surveys. Um, you know, if you go online, every country for the most part, especially where I was from, the US, um, had, has all these surveys, publicly available data, available online. You can go through them, you can, you know, you have to do, you can do cleaning them, you can check them out, you can figure out what the associations are. And this kind of survey research is the basis, kind of the, you know, the bread and butter of a lot of epidemiological research. Uh, it was also a great place for me to get started because I was an undergraduate and it was free. Uh, it's publicly available online. I could basically just download it and get started with data analysis and start teaching myself some things um, without you know, having to go off and get access to some special data source. Um, and we'll talk first about the studies that I did using survey data. Uh, but I will mention that surveys have a lot of limitations that uh, occasionally um, are overlooked and these novel data sources are designed to overcome. So first, you know, we know they're expensive. If you've ever applied for a grant to do a survey, uh, it's because it costs money to do a survey. Um, all these surveys come with some kind of an a priori hypothesis in some way. So you're, you can't really test something that you don't know about. And oftentimes, like, for surveillance purposes, by the time we know we want to care about something, uh, it might have already passed. Uh, so we, you know, there's, there's that kind of temporal resolution, which is very difficult, um, uh, you know, very difficult to get fast answers from surveys when you need to apply for funding and you know, get all that done. Uh, there's the Hawthorne effect and priming answers. Essentially, you know, this idea that maybe asking people questions is biasing their answers. And there's some, actually somebody uh, who was, couldn't attend the seminar sent me a very interesting question about that related to gambling disorders. Uh, that one of the symptoms of gambling disorder is that you deny it. And so how is it possible to survey people for it? It's very difficult. So that's a, uh, some of the limitations. So we'll start off with where I started. Um, I just, uh, there was a, you know, uh, obviously there's a lot of concerns regarding LGBTQ adolescents, um, particularly in the United States. And uh, as I've learned here in Ireland, where attitudes and things are changing, but clearly there's still major health disparities. And uh, my first idea was the United States kind of had their first big survey that gave a nationally representative um, sample for LGBTQ adolescents, or adolescents in general, and asked questions about LGBTQ uh, on it, starting in 2015. And that was the first one since like 2002 that even approached this kind of topic. It was the first time we were able to get a sense for what LGBTQ adolescents were at risk for. And a lot of people have looked at um, trends in adults and have tried to extrapolate that to children, um, a lot of people have also said that, you know, LGBTQ conditions are just much better now, so there's probably no health disparities, and our idea was to test that. So we looked at what the risk of, um, uh, what, what, what the risk of substance abuse for all these different kinds of uh, substances that were measured on the survey. Some were measured in 30 days and some were measured in lifetime. And after controlling for some covariates, we, you know, some important demographic controls, we were able to find that indeed there's huge disparity uh, does in fact exist. Um, you know, this line right here is kind of equivalence and everything to the right means that these people are at a greater risk after controlling for these, confound or these potential confounders. And the idea behind this is that, you know, now that we have this information, it's possible that we can direct the interventions towards this at-risk population. Um, and in fact, what we did was a little step forward. Um, ooh. I didn't, uh, I didn't include a graph for that one, okay. Uh, one, we, we looked a little bit about uh, how it differs, how this kind of risk and 
the next verse I'll talk about, differs according to sex and according to sexual orientation, being homosexual, identifying as homosexual, bisexual, um, or unsure. And we got a sense for what specific populations are at risk. Uh, one surprising finding, at least to me, um, which I later kind of found out uh, uh, has some level of replication in, in studies uh, for adults, is that there's this huge disparity in risk within, you know, heterogeneity of risk within the LGBT population. Uh, bisexual adolescents are at a huge risk for uh, a lot of these behavioral health conditions. And they kind of face the, the, the double whammy of they're at a huge risk, and they're still not necessarily um, protected. Uh, you know, they're still facing a lot of stigma, whereas more progress is being made towards uh, homosexual uh, adolescents. So if we look, if we looked at the very similar uh, idea for um, suicide risk. And as you can see this time, we, you know, this graph does break it out a little bit more. Um, the previous estimates were very old. And it's kind of the same exact story. We're just applying it to something different. And uh, what we found was, again, that these bisexuals or the uh, bisexual adolescents are at very, very high risk. Um, we also found that uh, uh, bisexual girls seem to be at very high risk. Um, and that these are kind of these populations that um, may or may not have the adequate resources or may have been overlooked. Um, so that's just kind of an example of how we might apply traditional surveillance. Another idea of how we would apply traditional surveillance um, is relating medical marijuana and uh, prescription drug use. So in the United States, there's been a lot of studies that have used ecological data to uh, correlate between medical marijuana legislation and all sorts of fun outcomes, uh, the most popular of which is prescription drug use. Um, and they hypothesize that this ecological relationship is due to people um, who use medical marijuana or are using much fewer prescription drugs. Um, and perhaps more poignantly, they're believing that maybe people who use medical marijuana are just at a very low risk of prescription drug use at all. Prescription drug use in the United States, similar to Ireland, is a very hot topic. Um, so this is obviously a priority conversation. And what we first did was we looked, we, uh, co-author Keith Humphreys and I um, looked at a paper that did, that kind of made this assertion, wrote a letter, and we said, we're not so sure about this. So there is something called the ecological fallacy, which well, the epidemiologists are aware of. And um, we're also not sure that the effect size can be as large as you possibly say it is. Um, there's only about, you know, from these surveys, we gathered that only about 2.5% of people in medical marijuana states report using medical marijuana. So for that reduction to be due to medical marijuana use, we have to see that people are reduced, you know, that these medical marijuana users were otherwise ridiculously heavy users of prescription drugs. And now they're still at a very high risk, but had shrunk down their risk from enormous to still bad. Um, so we talked about that, and eventually we ended up writing a paper of our own where we looked at uh, using medical marijuana as a kind of a risk marker for prescription drug use. And we found that prescription drug users do tend to be at high risk for just prescription drug use overall, this is medical and non-medical, um, non-medical use in general. And this is kind of a, an additional analysis that we did to say that it's probably not due to um, people with a similar health condition um, the, or a similar access to, to health care resources. So the idea behind all of this was basically just, we have all these patients who are medical marijuana users. They're all seeing a doctor that's a prerequisite for medical marijuana as opposed to recreational marijuana. And we might benefit by screening them for prescription drug use. So all these are examples of traditional surveillance, questions we can answer with traditional surveillance, and things that you know, I, was, I started off doing and I learned a lot about the research process. Sir. Um, about a year ago, I joined this team that works uh, almost exclusively with novel surveillance. Uh, and what they do is they look for really interesting sources of data uh, and how we might survey um, health trends using Google, trend, Google search trends, news, media, and popularity scores, Twitter posts, Facebook posts, Reddit. They've secured and amassed this kind of huge 
repository of data from all the internet sources uh, that overcome some of the major limitations of surveys. You know, you can figure out what people were searching on the internet two hours ago through a simple Google search right now on your phone. Um, we don't need a survey to do it. Now, granted, there's lots of limitations with these as well. They don't come with the same context. You don't get, usually don't get individual level data. Um, you uh, don't have the same rich number of covariates that you can use in a statistical analysis. But in terms of surveillance and figuring out what might be important, especially if time is of the essence, they can be really valuable. Um, so, the first thing that we applied, that I applied this to was this new product that's coming out that you probably have seen maybe in Ireland. It's called IQOS. IQOS is, or I Quit Ordinary Smoking, is a heat not burn product. Uh, basically what it does is it heats tobacco, not doesn't burn it, hence the name, and produces an aerosol that you can breathe in. Um, uh, some investigative work that I've done into why people are really interested in this, it kind of is twofold. One, uh, people are interested because e-cigarettes are very popular, and this is a way for big cigarette, big tobacco companies to kind of create something very similar to e-cigarettes that nobody else has done before. And if they uh, are able to cap, there's a market demand for them as people, originally people who smoked and then switched e-cigarettes, e don't get the same uh, authentic taste. This delivers that um, while still being somewhat health, health conscious, we'll say. Um, although results have been overall negative in terms of their healthiness. Believe it or not, the tobacco industry is not too involved with health research um, uh, or legitimate health research, I'll say. Um, so, my big concern, and the second reason is because these tobacco companies have really talked a lot about how this is going to be their new thing. I mean, all the big tobacco companies invested billions of dollars, kind of without anybody knowing about developing these products, and started releasing them in markets where people would accept them. Um, they were released first in Japan, and the problem was they came out, tobacco control activists were saying, oh my goodness, this could be really bad, this could be the new e-cigarette, but we don't know anything about it. And it takes a lot of time to get a survey together, it's, you know, some people had tried it, they were very small sample sizes. What, how do we get a sense for what people are really interested in? And especially when it's only available nationwide in Japan and, and a few other cities elsewhere. So what we did was we looked at just Google searches. And we looked for Google, we figured, we translated and back translated a few words that were related to heat not burn and IQOS in, J in Japanese. And we got a sense for what people were looking at, um, for when people were looking at, at these products and how much they were looking at it. And what's interesting is you can see that, you know, over time, since 2010, the USA electronic cig interest in electronic cigarettes has grown increasingly, and this is kind of correlated with their increasing adoption in the United States. But here we see in Japan as a as a, as, as a relative measure of the number of search number total number of Google searches that are executed in Japan, we go way up, I mean, even above e-cigarettes in just a very short time frame for IQOS. And this is really alarming. This says that people are really interested in this. And the more research that has come out since the publication of this paper have really kind of corroborated that. People are very interested in this product, especially in Japan and a few other test markets. Um, and it could, it's in FDA approval process in the US, it's entering different countries in the EU. This could kind of be the next thing. And if we're able to capture this and get out ahead of it, then that prepares the public health community to come up with those health messages that says, hey, you know, this isn't as safe as the tobacco companies want you to believe it is. Um, you know, telling teens and kids about it. You know, getting the regulations in place before they're already there, and now we're working. You know, we're fighting it backwards now. Oops. So this is a study that uh, I want to make sure that this is. Yeah, this is a study that I actually I contributed to, and I'm part of a study that's very similar, but it's by my team, so I'm not on this paper. Um, but this, there's very interesting, nonetheless, and kind of demonstrates another uh, application of these novel data sources. A lot of you might be familiar with 13 Reasons Why, and some of you might be familiar with the controversy that it shows this very graphic suicide scene, and a lot of people have said that it might encourage, um, you know, it, it might 
you know, bring people who are, who are thinking about suicide um, closer to closer to the act. Um, there's been a lot of controversy around it. Plenty of articles that were written about it, but we looked at it, or my team looked at it, again through Google searches. And what we looked at all these kinds of Google searches after doing some pruning for things like Suicide Squad came out. So we had to make sure that that wasn't part of it, and we cut it off at April 18th because that's when Aaron Hernandez, who was a famous football player in the U.S., committed suicide. Regardless, we after doing some data pruning or cleaning, we found that a lot of these search terms that don't have to do with 13 Reasons Why, but are related to suicide, started increasing after the release date. Um, you know, things like suicide hotline, how to kill yourself, uh, suicide ideation, um, all these things, suicidal quotes, all these things started increasing you know, pretty markedly right after the searches came out. And, uh, you know, that, that's something that was concerning, something we were able to capture. I mean, this paper, uh, came out like May 1st. I mean, you know, we're talking about two weeks within this. So, um, another thing that we're able to do, you know, surveys uh, are also able to capture people's behaviors in, uh, that people might not have considered. So people have talked a lot about these legal recreational marijuana markets in the United States. Uh, as you know, some states have legalized marijuana. Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Alaska, people are talking about it. It's the source of tons and tons of information of, of research topics. But what's also been happening that people really haven't talked about so much is um, an increase in seizures of uh, marijuana products by the USPS, the US Postal Service. Um, more and more people are mailing marijuana, which is concerning. And a lot of people have thought that this must be because of the deep web. And the deep web is certainly something where uh, you know, people are investigating. But the deep web is impossible to get through. The whole point of the deep web is that it's completely anonymous and you can't learn anything. This, uh, we looked at whether people were searching to buy marijuana online uh, on places like Google. And what we found was that over the course of the time frame, of course, searches for marijuana are increasing. Um, you know, marijuana was legalized in a number of states. It's becoming more and more popular. But also, the number of searches that relate to shopping for marijuana is also increasing. Searches like shop marijuana online, buy marijuana online. All these searches are increasing, and they're increasing particularly, um, you know, and, and they're, we, we can get a sense for where they're searching for it and where, what, um, where the greatest increases are. So this, is, this gives us a sense of what places are searching for it the most and where the greatest increases are. What we found is that there are millions of searches executed each month in the U.S. Uh, to look for marijuana. It's something that people really haven't talked about. And uh, um, I know that, are, that there are a few studies that are going on now that are looking at this kind of emerging topic. It's really cool to be part of a team that came up with a topic and now other people are researching. Um, this is one of my last examples. Uh, again, one thing that we're looking at is better temporal resolution. So surveys don't do a great job of, ex of figuring out when things happen, especially you know, very specific things. Uh, they don't know when you, uh, you know, it, it, they, they don't do a great job of looking at exposure, what happened the next day, because surveys take a long time to execute and that sort of thing. But one thing that we have been able to do with novel data is get a sense for what happens the next day of a policy intervention. So here, uh, a whole bunch of different states in the U.S. over the course of the past 15 years have increased their cigarette excise tax. tax. And some people have looked at that and said, um, you know, I, I've tried to figure out what that effect is on, um, we'll say, bootlegging cigarettes. Basically buying cheap, tax-free cigarettes online to avoid the excise tax. And what we did, what I did was I looked through and I looked at the Google searches for uh, cheap cigarettes. Um, and I, I tried to figure out when these when these searches for cheap cigarettes spiked. And using this really cool algorithm that was created for computer science, I was able to figure out what the spikes were and measure that up against when the cigarette excise tax was and figure out if the spikes actually did occur within just a few days of the excise tax. And what we found is that in our 12 different samples, one of them, one of them is the United States, 11 of them are the United States, uh, or it's the whole country, uh, 
a good proportion of them had these really big spikes right at the time of the excise tax, indicating that people really are responding by looking online for cheaper alternatives. However, we were also able to find that these searches did not persist. People may have looked at it the next day, they may have looked at it and said, oh, the cigarette's an extra dollar, I'm gonna go home and try to find somewhere else to buy it. Um, but the searches didn't persist, which indicates that people weren't continually searching online, you know, it didn't increase over the time. Um, so that was a, another pretty interesting thing. And uh, this is kind of, one of the, some of the new, newer stuff that we're looking at now. Um, again, temporal resolution doesn't tell us exactly when you do things. You know, you might tell me, have you had this kind of thought within the past month, within the past year? But this will give us an idea of when things are happening on an hourly basis. And we can use these uh, interesting time series metrics called wavelets to get a sense for how searches for different things, like I, I believe that this is for quitting smoking. And when did putting smoking searches increase and decrease over the course of the day? Now, one thing that was interesting that we, we haven't yet confirmed, but something that uh, we, we've kind of looked at, is that what if some of the services that we're offering are available at the wrong time? Um, we found, you know, in preliminary analyses that the morning is when uh, most people are searching for quit, quitting smoking. And the morning, by the morning, I mean 6 or 7 a.m. The uh, United States quit smoking line is open until 9 a.m. So there's an idea here that if we're able to get a better idea of the temporal resolution, we can get a sense for when people are actually calling the quit smoking line. And this works better than getting than tracking when the, when the calls are, um, because if you Google quit smoking line and you find out it's not open until 9 a.m., you're not going to call it at 6. Um, but this will give us a sense for when people are actually interested in those topics. So you might be wondering if all this novel data works, and there's emerging evidence that it does. Um, so we did something a while ago, or my team did something before I joined it that basically said that Charlie Sheen, uh, that guy who's a United States celebrity, probably international celebrity, I would guess, um, the guy from Two and a Half Men, so he went crazy. Anyway, he <laughs> um, he mentioned that that he. Uh, he, he went on TV and told everyone that he had HIV. And a previous study that my team had done said that, oh, well, at that time, a lot of people spiked in interest for HIV testing kits and all sorts of other things. Not about him specifically, but about testing themselves, getting tested. And there was an idea that for him, his announcement was worth the same interest as like three international aid states. So if we're able to capitalize on that, we could potentially maximize our investment in these you know, advertising or health promotion messaging by coinciding with things like this event where Charlie Sheen told people, hey, I have AIDS, that made other people think, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should consider my HIV status. Um, and, and we could capitalize on that if we were able to get that information in real time. But people were still critical. They thought, what do Google searches mean? They're just Google searches, who cares? What we did was we went off to a, the biggest provider of a home HIV testing kits. We got a sense for their weekly sales data. And what we found was that right when Charlie Sheen disclosed that he had HIV, they had a spike in their uh, sales. Their sales were significantly uh, impacted by this increase. So it's not just internet mumbo jumbo. People are really acting based on these searches. Um, and it was also cool to be part of this study because when we talked about it, they, I can't believe I'm saying this, but TMZ interviewed Charlie Sheen and he talked about our study. That was cool. Um, there all are some, in addition to this, you know, there are some ethical concerns. Um, and we've looked, done a little bit of investigating about that and talking about it, although the, the verdict is still out on how we should best proceed. Um, the problem is when we use things like Twitter data, um, you may be a research subject and you might not know it. If your Twitter data is public, that means that public health people like me might be reading it and categorizing it and then saying, you know, you're this way or that way. Um, and that's kind of an ethical issue. Um, you do agree to it, but then again, who reads their terms and services agreement when they join Twitter? Very few people. So what we did was we kind of surveyed some of the articles that have used tweets in the past, and a lot of them had quoted tweets. 
Um, and almost none of them had looked into these ethical concerns, had institutional review board or ethical approval, anything like that. So we talked about how this is kind of an issue that we're going to use it more and more, we need to look at it. And if Twitter is going to continue to provide this data to help, to help researchers, you know, eventually they're going to say, listen, you know, I don't want to be on the hook for this whole privacy concern. So we're just not going to offer it anymore. And that, that would be a big problem. So we need to address these ethical issues uh, soon, whether we're OK with people being research participants, how we work through you know, ethical review boards or, eth or IRBs, and how people preserve their privacy. One suggestion we came up with, a simple one, is just if you're going to use a quote, instead of quoting a direct tweet that you can take the quote, put it in Twitter, and you can find who tweeted it, just paraphrase it a bit. You know, if somebody says, you know, I love IQOS, they're the greatest they're the greatest uh, device, you could just say, I really like heat not burn or you know, uh, heat not burn products. They're a good product. And that kind of gives you the same sense in the terms of the article of what you're looking at. But it does, it's not reverse identifiable so easily. And if we look towards the future or beyond these ethical concerns, we're looking at kind of mixing the two. And one thing that we're trying to get a sense of now is how do we use the novel data, combine it with survey data, and get a sense for what people are really interested in relative to their level of need or level of you know, baseline level of interest. So, for example, how do we compare people's level of interest in quitting smoking versus the state's level of smoking? Um, and we can kind of get a sense for which states might have the best um, engagement with smoking given their baseline level of smoking. That's kind of the future for where this goes. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna, we're going a little bit over, so I'm going to skip some of this because this is just what I learned. Uh, overall, what I learned, I think what I learned more than anything was that uh, when I got started, you know, every published paper I thought was just perfect because it's published. And um, I thought, you know, a lot of these measures that are used must be the best measures to use. And what I found out was that maybe some of the best studies, especially in public health, where we're trying to reach practitioners and policymakers, are the studies that are able to make, you know, our analyses into real, interpretable results. Um, Things like, for example, odds ratios, which are virtually impossible to you know, understand, especially for, for common events over 10%. They're an approximation of the risk ratio, which is also confusing to policymakers. Um, finding out ways to give us a sense for, I think that we could cut, you know, that if we did this, we might be able to cut from 10% to 5%. is much more actionable to policymakers. And getting a sense for how to do that was a big part of my uh, and you know, graph it and visualize it was a big part of my learning from you know when I started off with the traditional surveys. What I'm doing now, um, and uh, I'm really glad that some of this has really taken off. Um, uh, and I was saving some of these kind of happy stories to the end. Um, so Netflix, you know, they, they had this 13 Reasons Why. People were very concerned. It's still a huge controversy. Unfortunately, they came out with a season two, um, so they really didn't take our advice. But to some extent they did, because at the end of every show, they now include Beyond the Reasons, um, which has an explanation of some of the, the talk through some of the issues, um, and gives some resources to people who might be struggling with these feelings. So that's pretty cool. I mean, Netflix is listening to this kind of research. Um, policymakers in the US and US senators asked the FDA to reject Philip Morris' IQS application. The, uh, granted, we didn't take a side on what, whether IQS was good or bad. But I don't think that senators would have been, you know, even talking about it. Really, a lot of this, you know, we're able to shape some of the narrative that people are really interested in. We've been featured in the news, um, and one of my favorites is that Chelsea Clinton tweeted one of my papers, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so overall, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I've learned so much over the course of the past few years, really diving into research, getting started. <laughs> On my own, very naively, um, I'll mention, but uh, I learned a lot from starting off with this traditional data, and I've been really thrilled to learn more about how novel data can be used for health. Um, it's been very exciting because, you know, not only do these papers come out, but occasionally people really respond to what we're doing, and I feel like that's, you know, kind of the whole point in doing this all together, um, potentially saving lives or helping people leave, live, leave healthier lives. 
And altogether, if we can you know, consider these novel data sources along with the traditional data sources and make our results as interpretable as possible to the people who can do something about it, the journalists, the policymakers, the practitioners in the world, uh, we can really make a difference. And that's it.